good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on where uh, you are joining us uh, from. Uh, it is uh, my personal privilege and pleasure to welcome Ms. Parsipur, a very dear old friend. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, working with her for um, more than, uh, for, I think, 30 years since her arrival here. Uh, by way of disclosure, I have to say, if I sound like a fan, uh, I am a fan of Blue Logos. Uh, when the book first came out in Persian, she kindly asked me to write an introduction to it. And uh, I wrote it and I, I thought it is a remarkable work of uh, fiction and a remarkable work of uh, praising the role of woman. Uh, before I ask uh, my first question, uh, I want to also uh, announce uh, something wonderfully uh, uh, auspicious. Uh, this uh, last month, uh, one of uh, our colleagues here at Stanford who teaches Persian language finished her dissertation at uh, UCLA. Uh, I was part of her doctoral committee. Her dissertation is on uh, Shah Nusha Parsipur and a comparison between her fiction and the tropes of her fiction and uh, uh, Sohre Bardi and uh, the argument that she makes is that uh, Shahanusha Parsipur has created a magic realist narrative as much from Iranian tradition as from uh, Western tradition. Uh, it is a very interesting argument and she has made it and it is a testimony to Ms. Parsipur's remarkable uh, career. Uh, welcome, Sarkar uh, Khanumeh Parsipur. My first question uh, is uh, essentially trying to place this conversation in the series of other conversations we've had. We've talked to uh, Iranian uh, women activists, scholars, uh, writers, poets uh, about the emerging Iranian women's movement. Um, you're the first one with whom we're talking who has uh, made her career uh, as a literally um, member of this movement. Uh, how do you see this movement and how do you see your relationship to this movement? Hello everybody, hello Dr. Milani, hello Roma. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I think Iran is in a very, uh, a special situation. The women there, they haven't the real right for freedom. And so they try hard to find a situation for themselves. And I think in the future, the women of Iran will find a very high uh, degree of freedom because they try hard and they go to prison to find their independence. And so this is the situation. Uh, and in terms of uh, the literally manifestations of this, the, the manifestation of it in poetry and fiction, uh, who other than yourself uh, do you think is working in this direction that our audience should know about, should read about? Yeah. When I, I published my book, Dog and the Long Winter, it was the second novel that a woman has written. The first one was the book of Mrs. Uh, uh, Ganeshwa, and the second one was mine. But now, I think more than 500 writers try hard to write the books and they struggle for their independence. And so it's a very special situation. I think Iran has a tumult to find the best situation. Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, again, for the audience, it might be interesting to know that over the last, I think, decade, the best-selling books, novels, both inside Iran and outside Iran, uh, have been written by Iranian women. 
uh, if you go to Europe, if you go to America, uh, and if you go to Iran, the books that have sold, the, the fiction books that have sold the most. And I know your book has been extremely well received in Iran. Uh, so could you tell those uh, who don't know about Blue Logos, uh, what the theme of Blue Logos is and how does it fit again in this story of the emerging woman as equal partners, at least equal, if not more important, than men in the making of this uh, future of Iran. When I wrote, uh, when I was writing Blue Logos, I thought that at last the power of, the political power will go to the army, to the people of army. And so, I wanted to write a book to show that now it's not possible to make it the, the dictatorship because the people are alive, they are, they know their uh, rights and they don't accept the power of army. So I write this book. And now I saw that the, my idea was correct because I read, I read in the uh, somewhere that Sepai Pastoran wanted to make the candidate for presidency. And so this is a divination that I had at that moment. Uh, in the Blue Logos, uh, one of the things that happens is uh, not just uh, cautioning the men uh, about their uh, attitudes, but I think also uh, underscoring the need for uh, women's logos, the Blue Logos being essentially a reference to uh, what we call, what we would call the feminine uh, view. Uh, how would you describe the blue logos as different from red logos or other uh, log logoses or logi? <laughs> <laughs> I think blue is the color of the woman. Mm -hmm. And the Mary, the mother of Christ, uh, is always in a blue chador. It means the sky. Mm -hmm. Because in some part of world like India or Egypt. The woman concept of the world was in the sky and the men were in the earth. And so blue is a feminine color. And I found it by uh, fire. When you have the fire in front of you, you see the different color. In the center of the fire, you find a black spot. That is the void, it's very cold, uh, this uh, black spot. And can I speak Farsi? Sure. Man idea ranga biru as شوله آتش گرفتن در مرکز آتش این نقطه تاریک هست که خالیه و اگه شما سر یک بیت رو اونجا بذارید روشن نمیشه خاموش میمونه بعد دورش زرده و بعد بالاترش قرمزه و در آخر جای آتش در پایین در اینجا یه قسمت آبیه ولی شما با آسمان هم که نگاه میکنید آبیه آبی آسمان و از زمیادی شعله واجگونه ای به طرف زمین میاد من از این ایده استفاده کردم I took the idea for blue logos blue uh, essentially from looking at uh, uh, a flame. Uh, when you look at the flame, at the center of it, you see a void. Uh, and uh, it, there is no 
it's a dark void. Uh, then there is a layer of yellow. Uh, above it is a layer of red. Uh, and then uh, at the hi highest or lowest point, you see the, the blue. And if you look at the sky, it too uh, it is blue. It is as if the sky is the end of a fire that is looking uh, downward at the earth. That was my idea in uh, choosing uh, a blue. Uh, uh, and of course, blue is, as you said, is a, as she said, is also the color of Christ. It's also in many other mythologies, the color of a woman. So one of the things that is remarkable, I think about Blue Logos uh, as a novel, uh, is uh, how rich it is in archetypal, what, what we would call archetypal references. Uh, you might not have consciously attempted to make all of these things, but one, when one reads it, it is so interwoven with so many mythological uh, uh, histories. What kind of a readings were you doing before you wrote this book? Were you do, uh, uh, before you wrote uh, Blue Logos? Uh, are there books that you think uh, influenced you most in uh, shaping uh, the narrative, other than the fire? No, I am under the influence of Chinese horror, uh, Chinese philosophy, and I always use the term of this concept in my idea, in my books, especially in Blue Lovers. I wanted to show that femininity of the world is something for itself, because in Iran, they have hide hidden the femininity of the world. But in Chinese uh, concept, you find it below, between the men, women, and the children. So it's very clear, perhaps in Iran, old Iran, in ancient Iran, we had this concept. Mm -hmm. But after Islam, we have found that she has, she's a hidden power. So I wanted to show it. To bring it up. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, because we are talking about feminism and literature and feminism and art, uh, one of the discussions that has been long going on is whether there is something called a feminine vision that is very different than a man's vision. In other words, if a woman writes or if a woman makes a film, is there something that defines that as very different than men? Or are they part of the same continuum? Some feminists have argued that there is a continuum. Some have argued that, no, there is a difference point of view. There is a difference. And I think in your book, one gets the sense that you think there is a difference but there needs to be a reconciliation and salvation will come only if we have both of these voices together. Am I right in understanding uh, your view? I'm not sure if there is a difference between woman, femininity, feminine concept and masculine concept. I think both of them, they try to explain the situation. Mm -hmm. Naturally, the men write more about the men and the women write more about the women because it's natural, because they live with the, their situation in the society. So uh, the women also like the men write, but more about the women. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, most remarkable uh, lectures of yours that I attended was many, many years ago. I don't know whether you remember it or not. It was at uh, Berkeley. He gave a talk. Uh, I think that might have been the origin of your book, Asier. And you gave a talk about uh, a woman who is sitting on a stone, on a big rock, not a stone is facing a desert and behind her are mountains. Uh, and you said, this, a woman in Iran today 
are faced with this dilemma. They're trying to make sense out of this world. A world where in front of them is this desert, in the back of them is this mountain. And they're standing there essentially alone. This was an image of you. You were the Asiya who was standing to make. Do you think women of Iran have now found, uh, begun to find their way out of this? Or are they still standing there alone, looking for a way out? Not the women understand that they must work with each other. They want to help each other. They, they need also the help of the men because naturally they live with each other. So the women are not alone now. They walk. They walk. They're not sitting there anymore. <laughs> yeah. And they go to prison. They go to the everywhere to find their independence. Uh, again, for those who haven't uh, read the book, uh, I really urge you to read it. And uh, I have to say, Professor Banum Parbar is one of the more prolific translators. He's translated many, many of the most important books. Uh, we are going to have him in a conference in a couple of weeks at Stanford because he also translated some of Meskub's work. Uh, so w once you read this, you get a sense of the richness of Ms. Parsipur's uh, uh, vision because you're as likely to hear uh, about a character from Greek mythology uh, as a character from Sohra Valdi. Uh, so uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about some of the mythical figures uh, for those who haven't read it that come into your play in this novel, Blue Logos, and help create this uh, uh, coming together of the feminine and the masculine. Um, is my question at all clear? Yes. I use several types of archetypal uh, figure, figure, figurative. Uh, I read the book of Sorbadi, read Logos, and it was very important for me because it was the uh, relation between a human being and Satan. And so it shows something like this in her book, in his book. And, and he used astrology. He explained astrology in this book. So I used astrology also. The concept of astrology is something dialectical. Mm -hmm. And I use it uh, a lot to make this book. But in the form of blue logos, I, I, I think it was like this. But you also use some figures from Greek mythology. Mm, yes, but not very. What is the main idea of this Greek, uh, Greek uh, mythology. Uh, the centaur, for example, who becomes very important at one point as the embodiment of these two figures. Uh, uh, yes, yes. I use it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but I don't know whether you have read the uh, uh, Dr. Shervine Mami's uh, dissertation, I don't know whether she has shared with you the last uh, iteration of her thesis, uh, but she has found some really remarkable structural similarities between uh, red logos, Sohrevardis, and your blue logos. Some structural parallels that are really fascinating. I don't think you uh, made it that way, but it has come out that way. It's a very interesting uh, structure. Have, have you read it? Uh, I know no, you talked, Yeah, I know you kindly talked to us several times and helped with the dissertation. How I can find this article? It's a dissertation. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Emami will be glad to send it to you. Uh, I I'll, will ask her to send it to you. Uh, uh, and of course, she has the decision to, uh, but I think you can access it also. It's going to be submitted. It's a, usually dissertations are a matter of public record. Uh, and uh, it, it's a dissertation she finished at uh, UCLA. Uh, 
uh, I would have certainly invited her to be part of this conversation, but she's on leave this quarter. Uh, and uh, if she wasn't on leave, we would have asked her to come and uh, participate, help in this uh, conversation. Uh, what is in your uh, 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 horizon in terms of writing? Are you working on an, a novel now? Or are you just uh, writing uh, essays and short stories? I know you're very prolific. Uh, unfortunately, I am empty. It's Three years that I never wrote anything. I cannot read. I cannot write. I don't know why I'm so like this. But there is nothing in my mind to write. But I look a lot of uh, serial. I look to the other work of the people. But personally, I am empty. You're never empty. First of all, uh, you're always full and effervescent. And even when you're empty, there is more in your emptiness than there is in a lot of us who are full. So don't ever think we don't know and don't appreciate how brilliantly effervescent you have been. Uh, I want to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, her prison memoirs, uh, uh, Parsipur's prison memoirs are really remarkable uh, for not just the amount of uh, hardship she has uh, suffered. Uh, it's one of the most brutally honest uh, prison memoirs. Uh, uh, I translated a very small part of it many, many, many years ago. Uh, then somebody fortunately translated the entire part. Uh, and if you read that, uh, and if you read the f almost five years that she was there, and if you read about how defiant she was in the face of uh, this brutality, uh, you understand what that regime has done and how we are lucky that even after all of that, she has continued to write a rather remarkable uh, collection of uh, uh, essays and uh, fiction and uh, uh, reviews. Uh, Roma talked about the many reviews she has written. She has written many, many, many reviews. Uh, and this, her dedication to write and her dedication to her craft, the classes that I know she has taught for uh, people, all um, at least force, forces me to say, as someone who loves the language and loves uh, literature, uh, how grateful we are to you for continuing uh, uh, your efforts. I, I really, truly uh, mean this. Uh, Thank you. But I have to ask you, what serial are you watching? <laughs> <laughs> the Turkish serial. Turkish serial. The Arabic serial. Ah, the yeah. Indian serial. Oh. Because, uh, yes, they are very interesting. I, I think this is your effort to stay in tune with Iran, because from what I hear from Iran, everybody in Iran is also watching these serials. These are <laughs> yes. very popular. <laughs> in Iran, uh, uh, particularly Turkish. Turkish serials are now said to be very, very, very popular. Around because in Turkish serial, you see an Iran of the, the epoch of Shah, Shah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The people are alike. Yeah. Uh, Turkey today uh, is uh, what Iran would have been like if Iran didn't have the Islamic uh, revolution. Yes, right. that's uh, and it's a, your desire to be in your. Uh, uh, were you involved in the process of translation of Blue Logos? Have you uh, compared it with the original at all? Mr. Uh, Kanun Parvar translated this book. I didn't know. And then he contacted me and told me that he has translated the book. He said it for me, and I read it. It was very interesting. Uh, I spoke with an American friend to edit the book, but Mr. Anubhava didn't accept. And he told, I want to print my book like this. So I was in contact with him. Yeah, uh, well, you know, he's a very reputable uh, translator and he's an academician. He understands words. I, I, I'm, 
I haven't compared it. I have begun to read it, uh, and it, it, it reads well. Are you happy with the other translations of your work? Uh, you know, my English is not very enough to understand if they are good or bad. I, I cannot uh, know it. But I had a good translator. Mm -hmm. uh, the translator of Kissing the Sword is very expert in her job. And so I think it's a good translation. And, and, and I think the translator of Tuba, because Tuba was translated at least twice, uh, and I, I did read the uh, translation that is now available. Uh, and that translation, I think, makes a very, very good effort to be true to the text. Yes, and, of course. Yeah. It's a very good translation. Uh, and again, uh, for uh, those who haven't read uh, and want to get a sense of uh, the plight of a uh, woman in Iran, uh, Tuba and the Meaning of uh, the Night is really a remarkable work. Uh, it is one of the best-selling novels in Iran. It is often, it's been often uh, written about. Uh, and it goes into a kind of, a, through a family, uh, offers a history of the last 100 years of Iran through the prism of a woman. Uh, it is a remarkably uh, both uh, engrossing narrative, but also a rich narrative. And uh, uh, the work of uh, Shirin Nishat in uh, that installation, again, I think that's available uh, online. You can go watch it and you see how, what an impact that uh, part of that one image of that book has had in a great artist like Shirin Nishat. I think you would uh, agree, right? You like that uh, installation that uh, Shirin Nishat has made? Pardon? You like that installation that uh, uh, one uh, uh, short she made. She made, yeah. Yeah, it was in Los Angeles. Yeah. I couldn't go there. Sorry. I like to see it, but unfortunately, I miss it. Oh, well, okay. Uh, uh, Did you see it? Uh, yes, I have seen it. I, 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 you, went, you went to Los Angeles? Uh, I saw the film version of it, I, and I did go to Los Angeles, yes. I, and uh, and it, it was a stunning. Uh, it was really stunning uh, because uh, sort of uh, you literally get pulled into, uh, again, you, you have to read the book uh, and you have to see how uh, the woman becomes sort of the tree of uh, uh, life in Iran, the tree of history in Iran. Uh, and the way she had the installation, you literally, once you enter that room, you become engrossed in it. It's one of her most, I think, successful uh, installations that I have ever seen. Okay. Uh, and uh, again, we also uh, had one program, past program, Ms. Ms. Parsipur, uh, that uh, uh, participated in a panel discussion about her uh, film version of her book about the uh, uh, woman without men. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and I think Goli Taraki was in that panel as well. It was a very interesting panel. And I think- uh, Yes, of course. Yeah, if you go back to that. Uh, I have uh, overstayed uh, my uh, uh, time. I think we, we have some maybe questions from the audience. Let's uh, uh, see if uh, Roma, has uh, questions that she wants to uh, ask, and uh, then hopefully I can maybe ask a couple of other questions at the end. Thank you, that sounds good. We do have a few questions. One viewer um, asks, can you describe Sadegh Hedayat's influence, if any, on your writings? Yes, of course. Um, under the influence of Sadegh Hedayat, and especially in his book, uh, blind old. The, I don't know if you read this book. It's a small book, but it's very interesting. And uh, the literature of Iran is based on this book. And I am under the influence of him. Uh, uh, if I may add, uh, uh, clearly, uh, for those who have read the uh, Blue Logos, uh, 
uh, and I think even uh, Tuba and the meaning of the night, uh, although uh, she has been influenced by the form of uh, the blind owl, Sadr Hedai's blind owl, but she has inversed the relationship because in blind owl, woman is essentially a victim. Uh, a, wom a woman is uh, either, you know, a, a priestly character or a prostitute, or she is an image on a, a pen holder. But in your narrative, you've taken that woman out of her essential imprisonment and liberated her. I, I, I mean, you know, my understanding is, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you're uh, influenced by the style, but you have inverse the man-woman relationship, this uh, attitude, this very unfortunate attitude Hedayat had to woman, you completely changed that. Am I right in that? Yes. Blue Rose is the analyze of blind art. And uh, it's really clear because if the people read the blind art in Blue Rose, they will find it and they understand what is the real relation. Between these two books. Yes. They say Marx took Hegel and made it upside down. You took Sadr Hedayat and made it upside down. <laughs> really, Sadr Hedayat was a male view of this relationship. You took that relationship, turned it around, and looked at it from a woman's perspective, I think. Yes. Thank you. Another viewer asks, what is the connection between Red Logos, a story by Sohre Badi, and Blue Logos? Red Logos is a book about astrology, but in a very special form. It means Satan meets with a man, meets, meets with Sohre Badi, and he explains the situation of the sky. My book also is in the same way. I use also this astrology, but in the form of blue logos. Perhaps the woman of the blue logos is a type of Satan. Like his book. Thank you. Dr. Man, did you want to comment? No, I'll comment later. Yes, I do want to say something about. I I think uh, uh, you know both of them. What connects them both, I think, uh, is that both blue logos and uh, uh, red logos are forms of what we would call, in terms of the history of ideas, a form of Gnosticism. In other words, trying to find the divine whether it's through astrology, whether it's through theology, whether it's through philosophy, psychology, contemplation, in yourself. And uh, Sohrabardi finds it uh, in a kind of uh, what uh, philosophers call the illuminationist school uh, of uh, philosophy. The light is inside you. And in uh, Miss uh, uh, Parsipur, the light that is inside her is as much the blue logos, the feminine boss, as much as a kind of a changed male logos. The male logos that is for domination, the male logos that wants to dominate the other side, silence the other side, or as in the case of Hedayat, decimate the other side, take it, chop her up, uh, is this time a logos that says, we can only live peacefully if we are together. Uh, it, it is really a remarkable uh, Gnosticism uh, because there is a tradition that says, uh, you know, if you read the Gospels, Gnostic Gospels, one of the things they say about the Gnostic Gospels, uh, Len Pagel's book, it says Gnostic Gospels are essentially about Logos being effeminate. For Shahanusha Parsipur, Logos that is liberating is must be both feminine and masculine. Please correct me, Makhano uh, Parsipur, if I'm wrong. You are right. <laughs> Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. I want to read a comment and a question from a viewer. They write, I want to thank everyone involved in this event, especially for making it available online. I have never been so moved by a webinar. 
As a fan of Ms. Parsipur's literature, as well as the writings of Dr. Milani, this has been wonderful to watch. And they ask, what urged Ms. Parsipur to write this book from a transnational perspective and deliberately merge symbolic images and mythologies in the world building? Okay, uh, I asked Dr. Milani to translate this question for me. خیلی تشکر کردم اونو فهمیدم میگه که چه چیز باعث شد که شما در تعیین این روایت و در تشکیل این روایت از مفاهیم و نمادهای فراملیتی استفاده بکنید و در واقع یک ترکیب جهانی از اسطوره و نماد و اینها استفاده بکنید برای اینکه این روایتتون رو شکل بده we live in the world and world now is very small a village naturally when you live in iran you live in the united states because you see always the american serial the american film the american literature or the russian poetry or the french philosophy naturally when you are in this world you made your book for the world. And because of this, Blue Logos is a, a book for world, not for all, only Iran. And, and when it's translated in English, and maybe hopefully, has it been translated into any other language, do you know? No. Uh, I, I have to say that it, it is a, uh, because I've read it very carefully when I, uh, when it, the, it Persian came out uh, to write the introduction. Uh, it's like Persian poetry. It's a very difficult book to translate because when uh, language is so deeply full of uh, symbols and references and nuances, translating it in a way is like translating the difficulty of translating poetry. Uh, I think it's very difficult to translate some of your work pre precisely because it has so many nuances of language. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, it's, many times it, it is uh, prose poetry uh, and uh, those are very difficult to translate. And I think uh, um, uh, that what might be one of the reasons that some of these works haven't uh, uh, been translated. I think it's not by accident that, for example, the only form of Iranian, the two forms of Iranian art that have become much more global than poetry, for example, or fiction, uh, or even music, is cinema and uh, painting, and to some extent, photography. These have a universal language, and you don't need to worry about translating them, but a fiction like yours, uh, translating the uh, uh, woman without men, or Tuba, or Ru Logos, all of these take a lot of effort, and uh, there's so many interreferences. They're so rich in their global uh, semiotics that it takes a very careful translator to do justice to it. But I hope they will do just in other languages. Thank you. Um, another viewer writes, you mentioned not being able to read or write recently and feeling empty inside. They ask, do you think that emptiness might be the effect of living far from the motherland? Perhaps. I am not very, con I have a lot of contact with American society. I am always at home. And from the moment that I came to the United States, I was always between the Iranians. I read the Iranian books. I wrote my books in Persian. I never go to the college. I never uh, try to study English because I was sick and I hadn't a good health to uh, contact the society. So I am in the United States. But in reality, I am in Iran. And because I am not in Iran, I cannot touch the society. So little by little, I become empty. It's 
long time, three, four years, that I never wrote anything. And I'm very sorry. Last night I had a dream about Shah of Iran. He was alive and uh, he wanted to write his biography, but we must help him to write it. And it was the first time in these years that I had a clear dream. Even in my dream I am empty. I don't see anything really. Well, uh... I think uh, 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 one of the most remarkable things about Ms. Parsipur in her fiction and in her uh, essays, even in her, some of her uh, uh, video messages, is a searing honesty. Uh, there's an honesty in her work. There's an honesty in her fiction. Uh, there's an honesty in her description of herself that is truly remarkable. Uh, Iranian intellectual tradition has been very much uh, shaped by the idea that intellectuals must act this way, they must act this way, they might not show, they must not show uh, uh, frailties, they, might not, they must not talk, talk about if they have a, a, a writer's block. I, I know for a fact that you wrote Blue Logos in a few weeks, if I remember correctly. There was a uh, explosion of creativity. And these, uh, uh, you know, writer's blocks, they come and they go. And someone like you, who is constantly uh, thinking about the world, the Asiya in, in you, will one day explode, uh, maybe tonight, after trying to help. Maybe you'll start writing a biography of the Shah tonight. Uh, help him tonight with your dream. So we all are looking forward for the end of your uh, writer's block. Uh, and I have to also say that I don't think there are too many writers in exile, Iranian writers in exile, who have been as prolific as you have. Uh, if you add the number of articles you have written, the number of uh, uh, novels, the number of lectures. Uh, uh, I had the good fortune of going with you to Brown uh, when there was a seminar. I saw your presentation there. And these, uh, if you add them together, the opus of your work in exile is simply remarkable. Uh, I know right now you're not writing, but you've written enough for the last, in the last 20 years for several lifetimes. We hope you write several more lifetimes, but we are very grateful for all you have done and all you have written. And as an Iranian, I am profoundly ashamed for what regime, this regime did to you in prison and surviving that, what it did to your mother, surviving all of that and coming out of that and still writing and still continuing to write. Uh, I'm just humbled to be in your presence. I truly mean that. Yes, Dr. Milani, I work a lot. I really work a lot. But unfortunately now, I'm empty. I don't do anything. And uh, even it's very strange. I read the book. I, I read the books. And I forget them probably. Yesterday, I finished the book. And then I closed it and I thought, what I have read, I didn't remember anything. Perhaps I'm in front of Alzheimer's, I'm not sure. Or perhaps the book was not memorable. Maybe the book <laughs> wasn't the book. Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rama uh, Khanum, uh, do you have another? Sure. There, there are a few questions. Um, one is if you feel comfortable, if you would like to say a few more words about why you were imprisoned in Iran. And then uh, another uh, question is if you're considering writing an autobiography. Uh, 
first the second question. Uh, I have written a biography, and I uh, is the name is Report of Life. You can find Persian version in my website. You can buy it from there. And second, I was in prison because of some journals in the car of my mother that they confiscated it and they brought my mother to prison and then they came to our home and they prisoned my brothers and me. And because of these journals, we are spent in prison. Whereas my brother had done nothing, he didn't know anything about the journals, but they kept it for one year. And another brother who accepted that the journals is his journal, he has spent two years, two days and a half. My mother has spent three years in the prison, and I spent four years and seven months. All of this is in my book, Prison Memoir, in English, Kissing the Sword. I want to tell you that Kissing the Sword, the brief version is Kissing the Sword. But all the book in the, is in the website of Fairness Press. Uh, let me say one word before you ask the next question about these present memoirs. Uh, uh, when uh, Ms. Parsipur uh, first came, uh, with the help of uh, uh, Ms. Allende, uh, uh, we organized a, a meeting uh, to celebrate her work. And after that, uh, Ms. Allende uh, uh, talked about her, uh, Ms. Parsipur talked to Allende about her uh, prison memoir. And uh, she said, you know, you should uh, write this. And, you know, she comes from Chile. She's seen her uncle, I think, uh, get killed by the Pinochet government. And when she read parts of this memoir, she said, this is one of the most moving prison memoirs I've ever seen. Uh, it's one of, it brings tears to every eyes. Uh, I remember in a meeting that uh, Ms. Allende was when she talked, and Parsipur talked about some of the things that have happened to her. Uh, Allende uh, wept essentially, said, I've never seen anything so moving, something so uh, brutal happen to her. And one of the reasons I, I need to tell people, one of the reasons Ms. Parsipur stayed for longer than everybody, she was in a car that was moving some leftist magazines out of their house. They were by accident stopped. Uh, she served more than everybody else, the brother, the mother who was driving the car, because she stood, first of all, she said, I won't leave if you don't release my mother. They wanted to release the mother, if I'm right. Right, I, I remember correctly. Uh, I, you, I they, was in the, car, in the car. My mother was alone. Once, no, in prison. Uh, in, prison, uh, yeah. in prison, they wanted to release you, and you said, no, if you don't release my mother, I won't go. Mm, yes. Uh, if she hadn't this, done this, she would have been, because she was already a very uh, accomplished writer. They wanted to let her go, but the injustice of it, she said, no, I'm not going to go, and ended up being in prison for four years. Ended up spending time in a grave-like uh, place. Uh, where she was immobile. I mean, you have to read that memoir uh, to see what this regime has done to one of the best, brightest writers of our time. It is their shame and it is my honor and I think all of our honor to be in your presence now. I truly mean this, Colonel Parsifal. Yes, of course. Thank you. I want to add a few comments that um, viewers have left thanking Ms. Parsipur for her honesty and openness. And I want to read a comment and a question by a viewer. They write, thank you so much, Ms. Parsipur, for her talk and Dr. Milani for his insights. I am deeply moved by Ms. Parsipur's unwavering commitment to write about what she truly believes in, a sentiment I seek to embody more often in my own life. Ms. Parsipur is a true inspiration. My question for her is, 
what is your advice for young writers who seek to write on topics normally left untouched or too controversial in society like you did? Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, I am answering for, for Persia. My friend Grandel, Nibis and Jamal, where sick of his hat called his Sodic Bosch, honest Bosch, Bohudish Bojohan. In Nahusin, as this kid of Aru, Nibis and Nikon. But who joined the church? Not us. Tas Nibis and تاس نویسنده رو میکشه و از کجا باشه و بنویسه uh, uh, she, she says I think young writers uh, must be honest uh, they must be honest with themselves they must be honest with the world that is the first principle of becoming a writer the second one is valor uh, you must not have have fear. Uh, uh, fear kills the writer. Kills, uh, fear kills writing. You must be valiant and you must write. I think that's a very good place to end this discussion uh, because our time is up. Uh, we, it's a good place to end uh, because uh, we are here to celebrate the life of a woman who has spent a whole lifetime fearless, a whole lifetime of writing the truth. And for her travails, our lives have been enriched and our understanding of despotism and our understanding of heroism has been enriched. So thank you for participating. Thank you for being who you are. Please continue being so that we can enjoy the fruits of your uh, wonderful, always full brain. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I want to read one last short comment from a viewer before we sign off. A viewer writes, please tell Ms. Parsipur that although my parents gave me life, she is one of the few people who has given meaning to my life. So, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And this, uh, this conversation was recorded, so we'll share it online shortly. Have a good day. <laughs>